To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for their care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank you all for joining our presentation today. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Gerald Evans, who will be presenting on anaplasmosis and the other less common tick-borne infections. Dr. Evans is the Chair of the Division of Infectious Diseases and a Professor in the Departments of Medicine, Biomedical and Molecular Sciences, and Pathology and Molecular Medicine at Queen's University. And he is an attending physician at the Kingston Health Sciences Centre. Dr. Evans has been the Medical Director of Infection and Prevention and Control at Kingston Health Sciences Centre and Province Care Hospital since 2011. He is also the Editor-in-Chief of the Official Journal of the Association of Microbiology and Infectious Disease Canada. We will have Dr. Evans present and they will open for questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering them into the chat box. You can raise your icon, uh, your hand using the icon, or if time allows, you can unmute and ask your questions directly. Please help us welcome Dr. Evans to the podium. I guess it's a virtual podium. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, I mean, it's sort of kind of interesting for me to talk about something other than COVID-19. And on that uh, point, I'm just going to also mention if I inadvertently say COVID-19, when I mean to say something like babesiosis, please forgive me. I've just been talking about COVID-19 for about two and a half years, uh, principally because I'm the Director of Infection Prevention and Control here. So uh, let me share my slides um, and we'll get started. Um, the other thing I would, uh, you know, just to point out to uh, the people who are, I know it's a fairly diverse audience, uh, I, I am, I'm, I'm a physician, so when I look at these infections, I look at them from a very clinical perspective, um, and so much of what you're going to see and hear today is really um, how I see how I see things as a physician, and and uh, for me, of course, one of the most challenging things is is uh, diagnosis and appropriate management by diagnosing these infections in individuals, and uh, certainly getting more and more experience all the time, uh, despite my three decades as an ID doc. So um, you can see here across the top, I just picked up this actually very cool little graphic which shows a number of different uh, tick species uh, and genuses and the diseases, infectious diseases that they can transmit in addition to some non-infectious diseases. So this is what we're gonna kind of talk about. Uh, I think uh, everyone is well aware that, um, that uh, Ticks are in incredibly important infectious disease vectors. They're second only to mosquitoes as vectors of human disease throughout the world, but they transmit a greater variety of pathogenic microorganisms than really any other arthropod vector. Um, and finally, I just want to underscore, I will not be discussing co-infections. I know this is always a very hot topic, uh, but literally that deserves its own uh, hour of discussion to sort of uh, look at the evidence and, and all of the, the uh, details and data that we have on co-infections. So I'm going to talk about these as distinct clinical entities. Um, as many of you know, uh, the problem uh, in terms of the prevalence of tick-borne diseases in general and infections uh, is principally being driven by a, a number of factors. One is climate change, and we know that as the globe and the world warms, uh, tick vectors uh, will be able to uh, migrate and sustain themselves uh, over winter uh, in areas that previously may have been hazardous to them uh, due to the uh, to the loss of, of that. And we don't have to rely anymore necessarily on just um, the migration of things like birds to bring those ticks into place. We've also seen a huge increase in the human wildlife interface with uh, humans encroaching on uh, areas that typically uh, where wildlife predominated and which existed and have continued to exist tick, tick ecosystems. Um, and that allows for more opportunities for ticks to encounter a human and to, uh, to uh, end up res resulting in transmission of an infectious agent. We know that tick vectors are becoming more competent uh, and they're able now to not only transmit diseases that are classically associated with them, but potentially others. And then of course, we've got the impact of international trade and travel, which is distributing tick vectors that previously existed on other continents like Asia. And we're now seeing the longhorn tick here uh, do that almost certainly uh, that um, introduction into uh, North America. Um, many of you are aware that there are non-infectious diseases that are mediated by toxins that are associated with ticks. 
Uh, and in particular, we have tick paralysis, which is uh, related to a secreted neurotoxin. Um, and uh, in uh, here in North America, principally uh, mediated by uh, dermacentor ticks, uh, it can resolve easily by just removing the tick. And it has a fairly high case, uh, a high case fatality rate in children if it's not detected uh, and even when detected. The other one, of course, is the alpha-gal allergy or the mammalian meat allergy, which is an allergic reaction uh, that's um, triggered uh, by exposure to um, uh, alpha-1,3 galactose, galactose, which is present uh, in the saliva of ticks, principally the Lone Star tick amblyoma americanum, and that can create a problem with the development of an allergic reaction, sometimes anaphylactic, uh, to the consumption of mammalian meat products. But I'm not going to talk about these uh, really much more because uh, these are non-infectious diseases, and I want to talk about infectious diseases. So when we look at the spectrum of infectious diseases that are transmitted by ticks, we see them involving multiple pathogens, including bacteria, viruses, and protozoal uh, pathogens. Uh, we're very familiar with the bacterial infections, particularly the Borreliosis, so what, what, Lyme disease is one example, uh, but with others um, uh, such as tick-borne relapsing fever, the uniqueness of Borrelia miyamotai uh, disease, and of course, uh, what is presumed to be a Borrelia or a bacterial infection with southern tick-associated uh, rash illness or starry. But there are a number of rickettsioses that have been known for years to be transmitted by ticks, and we're starting to see uh, the emergence of these uh, in significant numbers as, these, um, uh, as they move forward with the tick migration. There's my favorite disease, I, and I have to admit, this is, was one of my favorite diseases as a young ID doc, tularemia, because I saw a case uh, in Ottawa when I was a medical resident. It's always fascinated me. Um, and uh, we now know that, in fact, many cases of tularemia, in fact, are, are not transmitted necessarily just by exposure to the reservoir in nature, but by, are facilitated by a tick vector. And then there's the Bartonelloses, which we're getting a better handle on in terms of the role that ticks play in the transmission of those uh, particular bacterial pathogens. The viral pathogen have been known for years, tick-borne encephalitis in Europe, um, the Colorado tick fever, Poisson, which is very unique. We're going to talk about that because it has a sort of Ontario link. Um, and then other diseases like Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, and then the severe febrile illnesses as exemplified by Heartland virus and, and Alongshin virus, uh, which exists. Uh, in the States. And then I'm going to finish off a little bit by talking about babesiosis as an example of a protozoal infection. Um, and I, I threw this one in here because we're still not sure if this particular cat protozoan can infect humans, almost likely will, uh, but the evidence for that continues to be uh, accumulating. But certainly a problem uh, as a zoonosis with this potential transmission into, into humans. So I, these are uncommon because the numbers of them are low. And part of the problem, of course, is that not all of these diseases are reportable. And so what I put in this column is uh, the fact that uh, anaplasmosis, as an example, is only currently reportable in Manitoba, as is babesiosis. Tularemia and Poisson have been reportable, so we think these numbers may be reasonably accurate, but Rocky Mountain spotted fever is not. And these are the diseases I'm going to talk about uh, sort of a little bit more in depth as we go along. The Americans, of course, uh, do report uh, a number of these, and you can see the numbers uh, that are present in the states. Um, and then in Canada, we have some studies that have been done, including one by the Canadian Blood Service in 2013 and, uh, and a seroprevalence study that was done in Manitoba in 2018 around babesiosis because of the concern about transmission of babesiosis, much like malaria, uh, which can happen through, um, through blood transfusions. Uh, up to date, I could only find three published cases reported in Canada. Um, uh, in the medical literature. But you can see that these are all really kind of uncommon. But I'm going to start off with the discussion about anaplasmosis in a second, because it's almost certainly going to move from the uncommon to the more common one when we see large numbers in the states. And this is a, a rising number that has been going into the two, three, four, five thousand each year. This is the last year they reported in 2019 at over 5,000 cases. So this is going to become more common in Canada. Um, one of the challenges we have is that when you look at as an illness, a tick-borne illness, they have very similar signs and symptoms. And so um, we uh, certainly, uh, myself as an ID doctor, and I know my colleagues in internal medicine and pediatrics are always aware that as uh, spring emerges and we get into summer, um, those and into the fall, that we expect to see tick-borne illnesses and have to keep that uh, broadly in a differential when we're seeing a febrile patient for which 
someone may not have a diagnosis. And we know that symptoms develop usually a few weeks after the bite, although sometimes they can be sooner. And oftentimes they have these symptoms, which sound reasonable, but there are so many infectious diseases that can present with fever, rash, headache and fatigue, muscle and joint aches, that uh, this is why we keep a broad differential, but there are other things. And this is just an example. This is a, uh, just a tick bite eschgar uh, from, uh, I think it was somebody with rickettsial pox. And this is somebody who got bitten by uh, amblyoma americanum ticks, and it just produced these kind of little reactions around this area, uh, which, you know, I think most people would agree are probably arthropod uh, um, uh, bites, but um, uh, it can certainly manifest itself very differently. So let's talk about anaplasmosis. I put this up for self-serving things because I was one of the co-authors on this paper, which was uh, authored by my colleagues in internal medicine and, and Dr. Guan, who is our Associate Medical Officer of Health. Uh, this was a 79-year-old man who came into hospital in July, a uh, four-day history of fever, headache, some photophobia, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, he had noticed a tick previously to that about two weeks uh, because he liked to hike in the forest near his home. And he developed a red area around that bite that lasted about a day and then disappeared. Um, he had, was tachycardic, but normotensive. Uh, he was not tachypneic, uh, had good O2 saturation. And when we saw him, his temperature, or at least, well, sorry, when he was initially seen in emerge, his temperature was only 36.8, and his physical exam was unremarkable. However, when he was admitted, because he really felt unwell and there was concerns about the possibility of Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections, it was noted he had thrombocytopenia and leukopenia along with some anemia. His uh, liver transaminases were elevated, um, as was his bilirubin. And because of the history of tick bite, he was given doxycycline because we were concerned about the possibility. And lo and behold, about within about three days, his symptoms really resolved. And we ultimately found out what it was because we got follow-up serology and saw that his IgG titer to anaplasmophagocytophilum had increased from fourfold, had increased fourfold to one in 256 from a baseline. And that really proved that that's what was causing his illness, that it was quite a classic presentation. So that's just a, an example of a case that was seen uh, here in Ontario. Here's two papers published by some of my Canadian colleagues. This is a group in uh, Manitoba, as well as some of the, the folks from um, uh, PHAC, uh, in which they uh, looked at the case incidence of anaplasmosis uh, in Canada. And you can see this sort of what it seems to be clearly a rising case number, and which led to Manitoba actually having it as a reportable disease. And then we have, again, another group, including Robin Lindsay and Mark Nelder, Kurt Russell, who uh, look at ticks and found, you know, evidence of a, a anaplasmophagocytophilum uh, in, in ticks, as well as in patients, as you can see from this. So we know anaplasma has clearly arrived here and is, uh, uh, and is increasing in numbers. So in the broad category of what we call ehrlichiosis, uh, which includes, includes human monocytic ehrlichiosis and ehrlichiosis of wingii, we're here we're talking specifically about human anaplasmosis caused by anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is a uh, bacterial organism that infects uh, white blood cells, in particular granulocytes or neutrophils. Uh, it's a small gram-negative bacilli. It's an obligate intracytoplasmic pathogen. Uh, uh, Ehrlichias in general have uh, either a predilection to getting mon infecting monocytes or neutrophils with anaplasmosis, it's neutrophils, and you can see those actually within neutrophils when you examine them under a microscope, because you can see these morulae, uh, which are a conglomeration of the organism. When we look at the, the whole group of anaplasmosatii, we have monocyte trophism amongst the Ehrlichias, and then we have the granulites uh, trophism, uh, which we see with uh, anaplasma phagocytophilum. Um, so uh, it is now known to be the cause of human granulocytic anaplasmosis, which was called human granulocytic ehrlichiosis back uh, when it was first described in, in the early 1990s. But it's been known to be a disease uh, that was present in animals going back to as long ago as 1932, when it was seen in horses, sheep, and cattle. Um, and this is just an example of some morulae that you can see here. Uh, which contain, um, uh, which are contained within uh, these HL60 cells, uh, which have been infected with anaplasma. We have varying case definitions. A probable case includes a clinically compatible illness with either a single positive antibiotic titer or seeing the morulae. And a confirmed case, we usually rely on an increase in the antibody titer, a positive PCR assay, uh, and immunostaining that can happen. And then you can occasionally do isolation of anaplasma from a clinical specimen. 
We know the principal reservoir for anaplasmosis, very similar to what we see with some of the Borrelii, is in rodents, uh, the white-footed mouse here, which you can tell from uh, a deer mouse because of the length of its tail, otherwise they look very similar. Uh, wood rats, chipmunks, which I have a lot of in my backyard, and squirrels. And we know that uh, like Lyme disease, uh, the principal vector here are Izotes ticks, including Izotes scapularis specificus and ricinus. Um, what's interesting about anaplasmosis is that it doesn't really require a long attachment so, uh, time at all. In fact, it's thought that it can be transmitted literally within minutes following even a very brief attachment of a tick. And these uh, bacteria are able to infect neutrophils, and they do so by surviving the first oxidative burst that happens from neutrophils when they phagocytose a bacteria. Um, and then they can multiply within these cytoplasmic vacuoles that are left behind. And what they do do is they mess up neutrophil function so that they prevent um, uh, uh, things like uh, respiratory burst and other phagocytosis, which allows the organism an advantage of what we call a virulence factor to maintain itself uh, within the host. Um, and uh, it can increase the secretion of a number of different uh, interleukins and inflammatory proteins, uh, and that's a chemotract that increases the phagocytosis of neutrophils. So it really kind of knocks out part of the important system you have as an immune defense against bacteria. The other thing we know about anaplasmosis is it's not unique to North America in any sense. It's worldwide in its distribution. This is a, a, um, a little uh, update from 2019 in the US. You can see most of it follows exactly the same sort of distribution that one sees with uh, Lyme disease with highest incidence occurring in the Northeast and in the upper Midwest. And in Europe, you have a variety of uh, jurisdictions where cases have been uh, either confirmed cases been reported, probable cases, or suspected cases based on serology. So um, uh, this is not unique just to North America. It happens uh, over in Europe as well. The clinical presentation, unfortunately for us, but we're probably getting used to it now, is that it has nonspecific symptoms, fevers, chills, malaise, weakness, headache, myalgias, and arthralgias, which are unfortunately common with any kind of febrile illness. You may sometimes see an eschar at the bite site, uh, which can be important in helping things out uh, in, in sort of thinking about this. But typically when you see that, you're going to think about a tick-borne infection anyways. Um, patients can sometimes report GI or respiratory symptoms, but those are uncommon. As I mentioned, you do see a, a real reduction in, in platelets, white cells, and red cells. So you get pancytopenia, and you get some evidence of hepatocellular dysfunction with the elevation of liver transaminases. Some patients, a small minority of them, less than 10%, can actually present with life-threatening complications like acute respiratory failure, bleeding diathesis due to thrombocytopenia, and even sepsis or multi-system organ failure. And uh, those are, are important because um, uh, treatment must be initiated very quickly in order to prevent them from going on to more severe uh, outcomes like death. Um, about 30 to 50% of symptomatic cases will require hospitalization due to the severity of the presentation, but there are people who present with milder symptoms and may not actually end up in hospital. The case fatality rate with treatment is about 1%, um, uh, but can be as high as 7%, especially with uh, a life-threatening complication uh, presenting or uh, a failure to, uh, to be um, uh, seen and, and to have treatment initiated. The laboratory diagnosis, as I mentioned, uh, requires initially us to look at a peripheral smear of the blood where we can look for these morioli, which are basophilic aggregates within the cytoplasm of uh, neutrophils. Um, and we know that in some studies, 100% of patients uh, will present with these within the first week of illness. Uh, the presence of morioli are pretty well diagnostic in the vast majority of symptomatic patients. But if we see them, we would certainly initiate therapy right away uh, and move on to more uh, specific testing um, including looking at uh, um, uh, indirect immunofluorescence, um, which we can look at as well. We can look at serum samples, look for antibody titer increases. And early in the disease, you can do a PCR assay, uh, which can actually detect the anaplasma DNA right in, the, in a sample of whole blood. If you look at them under a microscope, a light microscope, this is what you tend to see. Here's a morioli with these little basophilic inclusions. Uh, here's an electron micrograph in which you can see the morioli all accumulating in these cytoplasmic vacuoles. These are the nucleuses of the, of the neutrophil layer itself. And that can be a real quick and easy way to sort of, um, uh, you know, get a probable confirmation of infection. Uh, serologically, I already mentioned, we do use an IFA assay. Um, you can look at IgM and IgG. IgM obviously being a marker sometimes of, a, of acute infection. 
Um, and most laboratories can conduct testing for IgG. And if it's over one in 64, and you've got symptoms, you pretty well got your diagnosis. Uh, we, in our case, looked at a fourfold rise in titer of the case that we uh, published in CMAJ. Um, and it's important to remember that antibody levels will decline over time, but sometimes they persist. And so you can actually look for evidence of past infection in some hosts. As I mentioned, the PCR, which is sort of the, the kind of go-to 21st century test, is useful. However, it's really only useful in the early course of the illness. Once that patient has gone on to symptoms that may be beyond two weeks, it becomes a little bit less sensitive. And then we rely on serology really to help us make that diagnosis. And PCR is not broadly available, but almost all the reference labs will now um, be able to provide that. How do you treat it? Well, the good news is, is that this is a bacterium that's uniformly susceptible to tetracycline. So doxycycline, the drug that we typically use to treat uh, early localized Lyme disease is also very effective in anaplasma phagocytophilum infection. Um, and so that started, and you do actually see an impressive clinical response. I've probably seen now about a dozen anaplasmosis cases here in Kingston. And I'm always impressed that typically within about 48 hours, patients clearly show an improvement. So not that that's a diagnostic way to look at things, but um, certainly it does help to bolster things as you're waiting for some of the other uh, results to come back. The typical dose is the same dose we use for uh, early localized Lyme, doxy, 100 milligrams, uh, Q12H, and it's typically given for 14 days, oftentimes because you are worried about co-infection with Borrelia burgdorferi, since the uh, tick that um, transmits it is also one that can transmit um, Lyme disease, and Lyme disease, of course, being much, much more common uh, than, the, uh, than anaplasmosis, at the moment at least, than some of the other diseases. Um, some people who've been given 10 days uh, will relapse, but that's really rarely ever been reported uh, with anaplasmosis. So basically what we're seeing is increasing human cases in Canada. I expect this to become out of the uncommon category, and if not already, it should be in the common or more common category. The clinical symptoms are somewhat nonspecific. If you were somebody like me who sees lots of uh, sick, febrile, and infected people, uh, there's not a uniqueness sometimes to these symptoms, but you need to suspect them in people who present in the spring and summer and sometimes into the fall. And if you see pancytopenia and liver enzyme elevations without another explanation, that might be the one clue that you're dealing with anaplasmosis. Uh, you could get a presumptive diagnosis just by looking at peripheral blood films. So we go and look at those with the hematopathologist. And if we see Morioli, we pretty well know we have it. And then we go off and send off these uh, further tests to confirm the case. So this is, um, this is the most common of the currently uncommon tick-borne infections, but almost certainly are going to be increasing in the years to come. Uh, so let's talk about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is a rickettsiosis, um, and it's always uh, uh, good to talk about this one because um, Howard Ricketts, who it's named after, Rickettsia, Rickettsia rickettsii, which is the organism, the infectious bacteria that causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, is actually named after Howard Ricketts. Uh, and Howard Ricketts actually died of uh, typhus. Um, I think it was tick-borne typhus uh, later in his life, but he was a uh, pathologist at the University of Chicago. Uh, it was first described in the late 1800s in the Bitterroot Valley in Montana was where it was called black measles because it presented with these petechial lesions, which were small hemorrhages in the skin, which oftentimes turned black. And what we know about the rickettsial organisms is that, that they're obligate intracellular pathogens of endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are the cells that line all your blood vessels. And rickettsias, all of the rickettsias have a predilection for endothelial cells. And many of their manifestations are related to the fact that they create problems with the integrity of blood vessels. Um, here in uh, North America, dermocenter ticks and amblyoma americanum are thought to be the main transmitters of it. Uh, it is one of the many infections which can be transovarially uh, transmitted from a tick who's laying eggs, as you can see here, so that the eggs themselves are infected. And so when the newborn tick comes out, and hatches from that egg, it's already infected with the pathogen. So you don't require the establishment necessarily in a cycle with a mammal because a female tick can actually transmit it to her offspring. Uh, we know Rocky Mountain spotted fever, although it's called Rocky Mountain, actually exists uh, across the country. And in fact, for a while in the 1990s, the most common location to get Rocky Mountain spotted fever in North America was in New York City, where the rodent population was endemically infected with rickettsia rickettsii. Uh, the highest rate are in children, probably because of their exposures. Um, and we know that exposure risk factors include exposure to dogs who carry a tick that uh, can be infected, the, these grassy areas, and of course, as I just mentioned, some urban environments, including large cities like New York City. 
The clinical manifestations are typical of what we see with what it's called the spotted fever group. So here's the patient. This is a rash, but it's a very unique rash when you look at it. It's petechial, meaning it's related to small hemorrhages in the skin, which are due to the loss of integrity of the blood vessels where the bacteria is actually uh, causing dysfunction. But it has a on to the classic triad onset with Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a high fever, myalgias, and a headache. This petechial rash, so it's very unique in some ways to all the rickettsial organisms. And it appears about three to five days after the fever starts. And typically, if you look for it, you'll either see history of a tick bite or at least a history of a risk for a tick bite. Uh, it can have GI uh, manifestations, including what looks like an acute abdomen, so something that you might see, like somebody who seems to have, have uh, appendicitis or whatever. And it's also been associated, particularly in children, with uh, the development of a meningeal uh, presentation, meningitis being a sort of stiff neck that we see with meningitis. And a CSF analysis often shows an elevation in white blood cells in the lumbar puncture and an elevated protein. Um, if you look at the lab findings, the white cells are usually normal as opposed to anaplasmosis, uh, but platelets are often decreased, and you see low serum sodiums in these uh, patients, although, again, low serum sodium is a manifestation of a number of different uh, infectious diseases. So you have to have a sort of high degree of suspicion. We make the diagnosis principally by serology, but you can also take biopsies, and that's oftentimes done in the rash. And what you can see here is this is a blood vessel. You can see here in the middle. And you see this red or pink staining, that's uh, this, an immunohistochemical staining of the endothelial cells that are infected with rickettsia rickettsii. So when you see a blood vessel like this, and you're using a specific fluorescent tag to, or a dye tag to an antibody against rickettsia rickettsii, and, it, and it, uh, it has this appearance, then you're dealing with a rickettsial infection, um, and almost certainly Rocky Mountain spotted fever in most of these circumstances. We do have PCRs uh, for uh, detecting the organism as we do for many. Um, and it's important because the differential diagnosis includes a number of diseases, some of which are not necessarily tick-borne like dengue fever, which is mosquito-borne, uh, chikungunya, mosquito, Zika is a mosquito and leptospirosis is a, an infection that often due to contamination of water supplies uh, by urine from infected animals. And this can have a somewhat similar presentation, although it would not have that kind of picture immunohistochemically. Uh, it's certainly a disease with known complications and poor outcomes. Uh, sepsis, again, is a pot potential presentation with this. Uh, neurologic um, symptoms because of that meningeal sort of phase can occur, and that can leave people afterwards with cognitive deficits, ataxia, which is a, a, a problem with their gait, even some paralysis, blindness, and deafness um, if this has been severe. Uh, patients have had limb amputations due to gangrene, remembering that if you have an infection that affects blood vessels, you can get thrombosis or clotting in those blood vessels, which ultimately leads to gangrene distally to that, um, and so that can happen. And as I mentioned, um, death can happen, particularly higher in children. And this is just a graph of case fatality rates of, uh, of Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, over about a 10-year period in the States, and you can see it was actually quite high, and some of that may have been due uh, to uh, under-recognition of the disease early on uh, when treatment can be initiated. And treatment with doxycycline uh, or any tetracycline uh, is really the, oftentimes, is the treatment of choice for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Once again, the tetracyclines come to the rescue, and typically the dose is the same as we talked about for anaplasmosis, 100 milligrams twice a day. Um, we used to worry about giving doxy to small children, but in fact, uh, you know, this problem with tooth staining or bone staining caused by tetracyclines when exposed to light is lesser of a problem than rescuing a child who may be seriously infected. In pregnant women, uh, you can use chloramphenicol, which is an old antibiotic, uh, but for which we still have a supply available. So let's move on to what I just told you a few minutes ago was my favorite disease ever since I was a young man, which is tularemia and not the least of which is it's oftentimes a course associated with legomorphs or rabbits and hares. Uh, and I believe this is an Eastern cottontail rabbit, which probably is not the one or the two or the three that live on my, on, uh, around my house, but uh, they certainly look the same. So we'll talk a little bit about the organism, a little bit about the history and go into the disease itself and, uh, and its treatment. So uh, it's caused by an organism called Francisella tularensis. Uh, which is another gram-negative intracellular pathogen that's principally um, seen in macrophages. Uh, it's a, an organism with a, a incredible environmental survival. It can persist for, for many, many months outside, 
uh, including in dead animals that may be around. And it's been found up to three years later in frozen meat from animals that are uh, infected with tularemia. It is easily killed by disinfectants and inactivated by heat, but that doesn't do you much good if you're not thinking about the possibility uh, earlier on. We know that there are at least two uh, different subspecies of uh, tularensis. Uh, the type A or tularensis biovar is the virulent one we see here in North America and principally seen in rabbits and hares. And then biovar holartica uh, is the less virulent one and found uh, not just in North America, but in Asia as well, and uh, with slightly different um, reservoirs that exist out there. Um, so interestingly, it was first described in humans only in the early part of the 20th century uh, found in California ground squirrels in 1911. And then through the 30s and 40s, there were waterborne outbreaks in Europe and in the Soviet Union. Uh, I guess I should, you know, I don't know what was the Soviet Union in the 40s. Um, and then uh, ultimately, uh, very interestingly, in the 50s and 60s, it was explored as a US biological warfare um, uh, program uh, to use as a bioweapon, because as we're going to talk about it, there are means of transmitting it that don't necessarily involve ticks. One of the interesting stories is uh, Martha's Vineyard, um, uh, where in the 1930s, uh, they introduced cottontail rabbits. Um, and uh, then they popped up with their first human case. And then uh, later on, there were clusters of mnemonic cases seen in the 70s. And by 2000s, there were other clusters of what was otherwise a rare disease um, seen in landscapers who were lawn mowing and bush cutting activities and likely being exposed to ticks. So again, showing you if you introduce the reservoir and you have a, a competent vector like a tick, uh, you can end up uh, actually introducing an infectious disease quite early. So as I mentioned, the reservoirs are typically mammals, mostly lagomorphs. This is a this is actually a Siberian hare, and I was to tell you that there is a cycle in, uh, that exists in Asia and Russia. Uh, this is a muskrat down here. And people who are who uh, are around these animals who may have a tick uh, transmitted from them uh, is certainly the most common probable transmission, especially in the spring and the summer. But by the fall, when uh, people may be exposed to these, and there are people who still trap rabbits and other animals uh, for various reasons, the first case of tularemia I ever saw was a man who trapped uh, muskrats and rabbits on a property east of Ottawa, and he developed ulcerative glandular tularemia. And the minute he told me he was uh, um, trapping animals, I thought, well, I wonder if this is tularemia. And that's almost certainly where he got it. And that was a case that occurred in the fall. And that typically happens. It's a pretty virulent organism. Uh, inhalation or inoculation only requires about 10 to 50 organisms. It's a little bit larger if you're eating it and ingesting it. This is another bacterium that has a transovarial transmission so that a tick can transmit it to eggs it's laying. Um, we know many, many species of ticks can transmit this. These are the three most common ones. Uh, also the ones that we talked about with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And in addition, there are other vectors, including the deer fly, uh, which can infrequently uh, transmit uh, tularemia if they've bitten a reservoir, um, uh, reservoir animal first. There's a lone star tick, of course, with the little dot on its back. Um, there are other routes of oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I did this one. There are other routes of transmission for tularemia, which I'm not going to talk about too much. You can you can have it by skinning an animal. So trappers who would be exposed to animal hides and that may get it. Uh, you can ingest it, of course, and it can be transmitted as aerosol uh, to produce a mnemonic form. And that's why it was uh, explored as a bioweapon uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, transmission from human to human is not thought to occur. It requires either a vector or some sort of transmission. Um, through those roots. Interestingly, it's a northern hemisphere only uh, bacteria. You do not see cases of tularemia in the southern hemisphere typically. And so you can see North America here and Asia, Europe, um, uh, and down into Japan, you can actually always find tularemia. This is an infection which has a multiplicity of, of uh, presentations. Uh, the incubation period can be as long as two weeks, but typically maybe only three or four days. It depends on the biovar that I mentioned before as to whether it's a virulent form. And we have six disease forms that have been described in humans. You get the, this, this is the uh, glandular form where you just get a lymph node enlargement. Here's an ulceral glandular one where there's an ulcer at the site of the tick bite, um, and then followed by enlargement of draining lymph nodes to that area. Oculoglandular refers to infection that occurs into the conjunctival surface and associated with preauricular lymphadenopathy. Then there's pharyngeal, the mnemonic, and then the typhoidal, which, yes, is probably a zebra. Uh, 
Um, so again, uh, onset of fever, chills, headache, and myalgia, not very specific, uh, but certainly once these develop, it will probably uh, point the clinician into the likely uh, diagnosis. Um, all the forms I've ever seen, and it's a rare disease, I've probably seen, I think, three cases now, including the one that I saw as a medical resident in Ottawa. Um, and the ulcerative glandular form is the most common. Very typical ulcer followed by regional lymphadenopathy, the draining area. Uh, once you see that, uh, you, all you have to do is roll, rule out things like sporotrichosis and a few other ulcerative glandular diseases, and then you pretty well are going to get it. History will oftentimes help you, especially if there's an exposure to uh, rabbits, hares, um, muskrats, etc. cetera. Uh, the glandular form is the second most common, um, and this represents about 85% of all cases. Oculoglandular, although unique, is not very common. Uh, and then the oropharyngeal, typhoidal, and pulmonary ones are really, really uncommon. The only thing about the pulmonary and typhoidal ones is they're associated with a very high case fatality rate. So early recognition and treatment would be very important in trying to prevent those sorts of outcomes. Um, you can culture this organism in a lab. This is a chocolate agar plate growing a Francisella tularensis. And in fact, in the case that I saw years ago as a medical resident in Ottawa, uh, we actually grew it in the lab, but we, we were aware that we were trying to grow a, an organism that's not allowed to be isolated in clinical microbiology laboratories. And so we had taped off the plates, but indeed that was Francisella tularensis. Um, it, you're really not supposed to do this. If a lab thinks they're dealing with tularemia, they have to forward it onto a reference lab for growth where it's handled appropriately. A serological assessment, you can look for antibodies against uh, Francisella tularensis through multiple techniques. There is a PCR available, and you can also do, of course, immunofluorescent staining of tissue samples or blood. Um, the good news about tularemia is you can treat it quite successfully. We use one of the oldest antibiotics that we have. Um, we still have some supply of it, streptomycin, which is an aminoglycoside, and it's actually considered the drug of choice. But we know that from studies, ciprofloxacin and doxycycline are also useful and they have been uh, um, successfully used to treat patients. We know that if you don't treat it, uh, mortality is not particularly high, except if you're dealing with typhoidal and pneumonic strains. Uh, so overall mortality is actually low, but if you ever see a case and suspect it, uh, you really should treat it. I, I would not leave a patient with tularemia even if they felt well uh, untreated. And remember that that type A uh, biovar, the Francisella tularensis, uh, Biovar tularensis has the higher case fatality rate. And that's what we deal with primarily here in North America. So I don't know how many people here have ever been to Northern Ontario. I, I've never been to Boston. I've been to Northern Ontario, but Boston is a small town uh, in Northern Ontario and unfortunately has um, the infamy associated with uh, the description of a form of tick-borne encephalitis called Boston encephalitis. Uh, it was first described in 1958 in a five-year-old child from Boston, Ontario. Um, but it's a fairly rare disease, and I go looking for this all the time because I see probably anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen cases of people who come to the hospital with encephalitis as a general clinical diagnosis, and we, we order this all the time because we're looking for the possibility of Powassan. It is considerably rarer than what we've talked about with the other diseases. Um, there have been a total of 27 reported cases from 1958 to 1998, and then 98 cases reported uh, from 1999 to 2016. So it's not really, really common, uh, but you know, it, it's an appreciable and a known uh, cause of encephalitis. Uh, it's a neurovirulent flavivirus, uh, which has two lineages. One which is dominant in North America, which is the Powassan lineage. And then the other lineage too, which is more common in uh, Asia, which is the deer tick virus. Um, it's the only member of the tick-borne encephalitis zero group, which is present in mainland North America. Otherwise, all the other ones tend to be in the European sphere, uh, where tick-borne encephalitis is a very um, well-known disease and has been seen by clinicians for many, many decades. Um, it's transmitted by various tick species. Uh, in the U.S., it's particularly uh, Isodi scapularis. Um, here in Canada, it's thought to be spread more commonly by Isodes cookii, which is the groundhog tick. Except everybody always reminds people that exposure to groundhog ticks and squirrel ticks is decidedly less common than it is to the deer tick, the Isodi scapularis. And so I would suspect that actually, if we were able to get a really good study done, we'd probably find out that scapularis, much like it is in the States, is probably the principal vector for cases of Wasson. And then, of course, there are other ticks that don't exist here at the moment, uh, such as the bush tick in Russia, 
which uh, is the responsible for transmitting it uh, in that country. Uh, it's a really challenging clinical diagnosis. You have to kind of think about it because there's no sort of necessarily specific picture. Um, and most cases we actually diagnose is after a patient's gone through an extensive workup, perhaps for a febrile illness, but also for the potential for an encephalitic illness, uh, in which case we, as I mentioned, we uh, very commonly ask for Poisson uh, serology to look for that. Uh, you can look at imaging, which sometimes will show you something. Tick-borne encephalitides in general tend to be associated with vascular injury, so you can see hemorrhage or infarction in parts of the brain. But in acute Poisson, you actually rarely see any abnormalities, even on MRI scanning. Serological tests are the gold standard, and you can order and get a Poisson-specific IgM antibody test done, which will confirm an acute infection. The CSF is always a little bit abnormal but it's not specifically abnormal. And you see, you know, things like an elevated white cell count, but not in the range you see for bacterial disease. You see elevations in proteins, but we see that in a variety of infectious and non-infectious CNS diseases. Um, and uh, other, other than that, there's really nothing specific on CSF analysis in general. Clinically, there's no sort of singular pathognomonic finding. You can have uh, everything from an asymptomatic infection, which is picked up quite incidentally in somebody perhaps who was uh, admitted for another problem in which that got thrown onto the panel of serological assessments, all the way up to severe encephalitis with an uh, intensive care unit stay and potentially even ultimate demise. Um, it's always important to remember that these tick-borne viral encephalitides tend to follow a more insidious pattern than what we see typically with bacterial meningoencephalitis, which tends to be very acute. There's no specific treatment for Poisson, so it's principally supportive waiting for the patient to recover. Um, but about 10% of cases, especially the neuroinvasive cases, obviously are fatal. And those that survive oftentimes are left with long lasting neurologic deficits, because you can imagine vascular compromise in the brain can produce syndromes associated with stroke um, and or bleeding, et cetera. And so the same sort of kinds of sequelae. The risk of Poisson uh, in Canada is very low. As I mentioned in the table I showed you a little while ago, only about 21 cases reported as of 2017, but uh, again, it's one of those ones we have to recognize that we may be missing cases all the time uh, if they're not investigated um, appropriately with uh, serological assessments, et cetera. Uh, so let's move on to protozoal organisms. We've covered some, back, some examples of bacterial and viral infections. Uh, babesiosis is probably the, the big one that I think we're going to begin to see as an increasingly more common problem. Um, uh, Babesii are uh, intraerythrocytic protozoal parasites that infect red cells. Here's some red blood cells, and you can see these uh, organisms here. And this one looks like it's making a little cross. Um, and they, in, in many ways, uh, bear a lot of similarity to malaria, which is another uh, parasite that causes an intraerythrocytic infection. Um, and uh, what's interesting about babesiosis is that it's the same vector in animal reservoir and ge geographic distribution as Lyme. So if you're seeing Lyme like we are here, you should be starting to see babesiosis. And we now know that there are now case reports of people who have acquired babesiosis in Canada without any history of travel elsewhere. There's lots of different species of babesii. These four are the ones most commonly implicated that parasitize humans. And microti is the most common species that we see here in uh, North America. Should put North America there, it makes it look like it's the Americans. And divergence is the most common species that's uh, infecting humans in Europe. Very com complex, the, uh, the life cycle of this. Um, you have ticks which basically undergo sporogeny, which allows them, so they, they ingest it, they get fertilization in the gut of the two gametes, um, which allows the production of sporozoites. Uh, which they can then transmit uh, principally to uh, small rodent vectors, where it undergoes uh, a merogeny with a trophozoite, a merozoite, leading to repeated infections of red cells, ultimately the production of a gamete. And when the tick then feeds on an animal that's infected, it picks up these gametes and then it, it enters into the tick cycle again. And all humans do is that we get involved, unfortunately, in this little thing uh, where the tick, instead of biting a mouse, ends up biting us. And then you get the same sort of trophozoite, merozoite amplification of the, of the parasite within red blood cells. And then of course, because humans donate and receive blood, uh, you can look at transfusion um, transmission occurring uh, between humans. So an interesting thing when you're dealing with a parasite. 
It is principally tick-borne, but it's important to remember that babesiosis has been described as being transmitted uh, congenitally or perinatally from a mother to a child, and of course, through transfusions from an infected donor. Um, currently, we don't routinely test Babesia in donated blood products, but uh, that is uh, likely to happen as this increasingly becomes a uh, medical problem here. The disease is interesting. A lot of patients get the disease and never have symptoms, but it can be picked up if, the, uh, if their blood is examined or if they're donating blood and it gets screened. Um, and in those in individuals, much like in malaria, we see a very low level of parasitemia of the red cells, and it may be too low to detect. We know that chronic infection can occur, and that can happen for months or even years. Uh, and that can result in, of course, a transmission through blood donation or transmission from an infected mother to an unborn child. And then acute infection rarely can present with severe illness and death. Um, and that's principally seen in Im individuals who are immunocompromised or suppress uh, immunosuppressed. Uh, people without spleens and elderly persons in particular have trouble removing uh, intravascular infections that affect red cells because those, uh, that organ is either not present or it's not functioning as well as it did when they were younger. And so we have to think about that. And actually, babesiosis is uh, one more comment on co-infection. It's actually picked up oftentimes because you have somebody with Lyme disease uh, and you're seeing some unusual features, perhaps in a red blood cells of their peripheral smear. And then you recognize they have babesiosis um, and recognize you have to treat that as well. So it's very malaria-like, fevers, chills, fatigue, myalgia. This is getting to be a bit of a script here, I've already told you. But what's unique about these folks is they can end up with hemolytic anemia with jaundice, uh, all because of the hemolysis of red cells uh, producing an overabundance of um, hemoglobin, which is eventually reduced to bilirubin. Uh, headache, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, again, are, are other features, principally anorexia in chronically infected individuals. And kind of like what we saw a little bit in anaplasmosis, low platelets, low white blood cells, and to some degree anemia. And you can see here the, um, I think, oh, it didn't come out. Uh, this is actually uh, microti. This is divergence. That's actually malaria. That's falciparum, and that's vivax. So you can see when, if you're looking down a microscope at a red cell, you better be a good hematopathologist or microbiologist to be able to differentiate these various trophozoites, which can be present in, in red cells. But they'll be the clue to the uh, diagnosis. Um, oh, this is interesting. My my presentation seems to have halted itself. Oh, wait a minute here. So what's the diagnosis? So one of the cool features we see is this uh, Maltese cross appearance um, uh, of the uh, of Babesia in red cells. Um, and when you see that, and we've seen that in a couple of cases we've had here, uh, pretty easy to make the diagnosis. Uh, these were all in patients who also had a diagnosis of Lyme disease uh, that was found serologically. So you can make the diagnosis relatively quickly. Um, Interestingly enough, the recommendation is if you see an asymptomatic infection, not treat it. Uh, if you're seeing somebody who is um, ill or unwell, you treat immunocompetent individuals typically with clinda, plus either quinine or quinidine. Quinine, uh, probably a little bit less available than quinidine. <clears throat> and if they're immunocompromised, we use a combination of azithromycin and atovaquone, uh, and all of them given for seven to 10 days. In very severe infections, we actually can do an exchange transfusion where we we take your blood and we replace it with good blood or blood that's not infected, uh, but those have been relatively uncommon in having to deal with them. So let me wind up by just saying, you know, I've just shown you there's a multiplicity of infections transmitted by ticks, except for Lyme disease and now anaplasmosis. These are generally uncommon in Canada. And I think anaplasmosis is the next disease that we're going to start to see a significant rise in. Prevalence is continuing to increase with the expansion of tick populations from climate change. And as I mentioned, the encroachment of humans into wildlife areas. Um, many of them present with similar clinical signs and symptoms. And so if you're gonna make an accurate diagnosis of what the infecting pathogen is or pathogens, you need to do laboratory testing to help out with that. Uh, fortunately, you know, we start treatment oftentimes though just based on the clinical findings, um, especially if we can dig up a history of exposure or risk exposures to ticks. Many, but not all are increasingly reportable. Uh, I think we need to get into reporting um, these diseases now nationwide and not just have anaplasmosis and babesiosis reported in Manitoba, but not elsewhere. And most, are, of course, are treatable with antimicrobial therapy, which does make uh, um, the job somewhat uh, easier to do uh, at times um, and certainly helps us to, uh, to successfully treat patients uh, as much as possible. So I am going to stop at that point uh, and uh, happy to...
answer a few questions. Remember, I'm a doctor, not a entomologist and not a virologist, microbiologist, whatever else. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans, for your very informative presentation. We are moving over to uh, questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat box right this moment, but if you have a question, uh, oh, I see Dr. Vordu has a question with his hand up. I will go to Dr. Vordu first. Hello, um, very nice uh, talk, Dr. Evans. Really, really interesting to hear about these uh, rare tick-borne infections. I had a question. So uh, in, in Europe, where there's a lot of tick-borne encephalitis, uh, they've got this great vaccine that's been very effective. And I, I was wondering, has anyone ever looked at whether that would have cross protection against Powassan virus? Are those two viruses at all closely related or is it a completely, it's a... Yeah, that, that's a great question. <laughs> and, and I'll defer by saying I'm not a virologist uh, as in general uh, training, but uh, it's a great question. I, I would think they would um, uh, would have examined that by now, but uh, that's an interesting question. I'd probably look up after I've, I come off this talk to sort of uh, determine that. I think there's a, a, a significant difference between Poisson. Um, it's a Tebow virus, and the uh, ones that are circulated in Europe, are, I think, are uh, predominantly, I could be wrong about flebby viruses. So they're a different sort of subgenre oh. of flebby virus. So okay. it may be, they may be essentially different, but, um, you know, I think the other thing, uh, that's worth commenting on is that, you know, tick-borne encephalitis has been such a, a significant problem in Europe for many, many years. That's where the impetus is to develop vaccines to prevent illness, especially with people hiking up in the mountains in all of those areas where they're going to be exposed to ticks. And I think the, the challenge with Boston is it's considered to still be a pretty uncommon infection. Um, right. So, you know, I guess the impetus for somebody to develop a vaccine is probably pretty low. Um, right. You could certainly offer it to people who are going to have those kinds of exposures. But I suspect that's probably why there isn't a vaccine at the moment for Poisson. Okay. Yeah. And, and you're right. Uh, TBE in Europe, that is a flavivirus. I, I thought Poisson was a flavivirus as well, but you're, you're saying it's not. It, it's not a flavivirus. Uh, hang on a sec, because it is, it, but it's a specific subgenre. I got to oh, get out of my okay. slides to move on to this thing. Um, if you look, uh, where's that table I had? Uh, Poisson, where's Poisson? Yeah. yeah, it's a Flavy virus too, but it's a Tebow virus in the Flavy virus group. Okay. So they're, they're within the Flavy virus, a pre pretty big family of viruses, right? And there's all these little uh, subgenres and stuff like that, where the, the structure of the virus may be very different when you look at the, the sort of um, analysis of the RNA. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Vordo. Uh, Terry, I know you had your hand up next, and then we'll go to the chat. There is a question. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Evans. I am um, kind of humbled to ask this question because I don't understand as much as you do. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, some infectious diseases, can't, there's a link to cancer. And researchers have found, and they're finding in the States, a link towards a very rare brain cancer you're going to have to forgive my pronunciation of the cancer, glismoboplasma. It's what Gord Downey uh, died of. And I'm just wondering, are we looking at that in Canada at all? Thank you. Yeah, I think you said a glioblastoma. Glioblastomas are malignant tumors of the brain um, and, and unfortunately rising in incidence, which is interesting. Uh, I, I've not myself personally seen any link to it. I, I would be very interested to sort of see if, you know, uh, groups that study glioblastoma tissue um, are exploring potential infectious pathogens that might be seen within, within the tumor that would suggest the potential that that's an etiological agent or maybe not etiological, but playing a role in the development of glioblastomas. And the reason I say that is because gliomas in general are tumors of the glial cells. The glial cells are the the supportive cells within the brain. They're not the neurons, but they're the cells that support the neurons, but they also act as an immune reactant uh, cell line within the brain. So an inflammatory trigger, like an infection, could turn these glial cells on, and that sort of uh, triggering of glial cell proliferation, for instance, could result in a malignant transformation that gives you glioma. Now, I'm being really careful here. I'm not a neurologist. I'm not a neuropathologist. <laughs> but, you know, I, I certainly know that 
Right now, we have a real big interest in exploring infectious pathogens as a cause of Alzheimer's disease, uh, because Alzheimer's is associated with glial reactions too that produce these neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid deposits. So it's possible that there's a link there, Terry, um, but I myself haven't come across much, uh, but it might be out there and some of the people are beginning to explore you know, the, those sorts of reasons why, for instance, a, a diagnosis like glioblastoma seems to be rising at the same time that we're seeing you know, rising rates of things like tick-borne infections, for sure. Oh, I really appreciate that. And it, you know, it's kind of ironic that Gordani is from Kingston and Kingston is endemic for Lyme disease. So, I mean, if there is a link, that would be very nice to know. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. No Thank you so much, Terry, for your questions. So, Dr. Evans, I know you gave us a lot of information about the various tick-borne diseases that are out there. Um, this is just taking in one of the questions that was asked. And, you know, the key thing you pointed out, which a lot of our clinicians have pointed out in their various talks is clin clinical manifestations, start thinking outside the box, you know, especially times of years, environments and stuff that's going on. Um, I guess the question was around medical school training. Is it, is this a standard curriculum, you know, tick-borne disease and Lyme disease? Is that something that is taught standard across medical schools? Or um, I would imagine now we were getting more information. It, it's probably something covered in some of the training, but we wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, is that a common thing? Yeah, well, we certainly we certainly included an undergraduate uh, medical education in the infectious diseases portions of the curriculum, which tends to get thrown around all. Hard for me to speak about what's happening in other centers. I know they do it in Nova Scotia. Uh, a couple of my colleagues there are, are who are at uh, Dalhousie University have also told me that they provide that. We are certainly spending a considerable amount of time when medical students hit their clerkship, that is, they're out there seeing patients in the hospitals and clinics with us, uh, as well as during postgraduate training as residents, we teach them about tick-borne infections, co-infections being, uh, having to be looked at very carefully because they're becoming increasingly common, given that there's a common tick vector, which may harbor more than one pathogen for sure. Um, uh, certainly, I've been uh, looking at um, the, I'm mostly interested in babesiosis. There has been some very good data suggesting that there has been a creep of babesiosis up, for instance, into the eastern townships of Quebec, given their close border proximity to the northern New England states. Um, so um, I know that some of my colleagues there have seen some uh, increasing numbers of babesiosis cases, and oftentimes, of course, associated with a co-infection with, uh, with uh, Borrelia uh, and Lyme disease. So yeah, it, it, we are being there. That's being taught quite extensively through many medical school curricula. I just can't tell you what's happening at every medical school. Um, there are now 17 medical schools in Canada. So uh, I, I know I have some intimate knowledge of this one for obvious reasons since I've been here for about 30 years. But um, and I am aware that a couple of others probably are doing it as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. And I do notice we've got a number of our medical officers of health from across this country on the call. I do want to just remind them that all the videos throughout Lyme this Lyme month have been recorded. Some great talks of Dr. Evans and Dr. Bar Baranchuk on Lyme carditis. We're happy to share the videos with your, uh, if you want to download them um, off our website and share them with your residents and medical students because they're great informative videos. I do want to just push that out there. It looks like Terry has another question for Dr. Evans. Go ahead, Terry. Sorry, I'm kind of inspired uh, today by what we're talking about. So I just want to follow up with another question. Um, you know, when we do autopsies on tissues, are we looking for Borrelia, like the pathogens, like in those tissues? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I would... I, I can tell you when we, we're dealing with an infectious disease, someone perhaps who has passed away from an un, unknown infectious disease or even one that's known, uh, we oftentimes uh, are interested, especially if we see pathological changes in various organ systems, uh, they'll be explored with immunohistochemical staining to look for evidence of other things, including Borrelia. It is not standard, however, for all patients undergoing autopsies for a variety of things to have that done routinely. That would be uh, based on the input um, or the decision-making of the pathologist and the input of the clinical team who may have been managing the patient as to whether or not they explore those kinds of um, immunohistochemical stainings in someone who has passed away from uh, uh, whatever condition they've had. 
Thank you so much, Terry, for your questions. I don't see any additional questions. And looking at the time, I know Dr. Evans um, is busy and has lots of things on the go today. So I do want to personally thank Dr. Evans for taking the time today to, with his presentation. Um, thank you again. And I just wanted to remind everybody that we are back tomorrow. Uh, we have Siro Akawu, who is presenting on spatial and temporal patterns of the black legged tick Exodes scapularis and Lyme disease in Ontario, Canada, making a case for a One Health surveillance approach. His uh, talk will be tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We do hope you can join us and we also will have another presentation this Thursday. Um, just a reminder to take part in our challenge, wear green, wear a green face mask, take a photo and share it with us. Um, send it in. If you don't like your photos taken, you can always send in pieces of artwork or creativity. We're happy to take any entry that best represents Lyme disease awareness events. All entries received to send to clydernetgmail.com will be entered into our draw for one of four $25 Starbucks gift cards that will be occurring on the last day of our presentations. We do wrap up with two presentations next week on the 30th and our last one on the 31st. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And have a great day and a great rest of your week. And hope to catch you tomorrow at our presentation. Take care.